My parents didn't really know what to do. Um, I think they found it quite hard. It was only then uh, was I diagnosed with a, a possible diagnosis of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. The more I realised how things affected me and how I reacted to them. Uh, hi, my name is Mark Bridgman. I'm a member of the team at Changing Faces. Uh, basically, our project is all about removing the stigma that's associated with mental health. So in a few moments, you're going to see a few people uh, that have agreed to be filmed and talk about their experiences of mental health with us. And we hope that you'll find this uh, recording to be really, really beneficial and uh, it'll go some way towards removing the stigma that's associated with mental health. Yeah, I'm uh, Di Sharkey. Um I'm a, a, a Welsh singer-songwriter, um, and I also suffer with schizophrenia. Um, I also uh, do some work for Time to Change Wales, which is a national campaign against uh, stigma and discrimination around mental health. It first became sort of an inference on my life, an interference. Um, when I was 18, I, I had a, a bit of a breakdown where I, mm. I sort of lost touch with what was going on in my life um, and uh, went to mental health services and then I was first diagnosed as what was called in those days manic depression um, and uh, it took me a long while to get over, uh, well to, to recover, um, but it's from that point, from the time I was 18, this is going back to the late 80s, um, uh, I was in and out of mental health services. Always, uh, I never understood what was going on. I didn't understand you know, why uh, I thought that things had changed. My outlook had changed. My view of the world had changed. Things were going on in my head that I didn't understand. And um, I, I, I was always seeking through mental health services some sort of answers. But um, of course, um, the mental health services and psychiatry generally is still a rather vague practice. And I wasn't really finding many answers. Um, so I, I, I was just in my early 20s and I went to college and I studied psychology and um, uh, I, 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 counseling I studied and also um, sociology. And uh, through that study, I started to understand how mental health works and how the brain works, how, um, how the, ex the problems that people experience. And through that, I started to build a picture up of exactly um, what was happening with myself. Mm -hmm. Several breakdowns later, um, I ended up getting sectioned um, uh, the first time I was sectioned. Uh, it was a really uh, problematic time in my life and it was only then uh, was I diagnosed with a, a possible diagnosis of schizophrenia um, and it, it was subsequent sectioning and visits through mental health services that that sort of diagnosis was confirmed um, uh, right up until recent years but obviously through age experience wisdom and also my sort of self-learning um, I've not only sort of learned to how to deal with my own personal issues but also I sort of understand how the illness works. Uh, I understand you've got a history of uh, depression. Yeah, small one. Small one. Yeah, small one, small one. When you say small one, you mean small, small? A couple of years. A couple of years. Yeah, couple yeah, years okay. you know. Is there um, uh, any one moment when you look back then you can say, well, you know, that was the start of it all for me? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, okay. Basically the start of it was when I was about a month after I turned 18. Yeah, okay. Uh, my grandfather died on the Tuesday. Right, yeah. And of course, I, I was very close to my grandfather. That was my mother's father. Yeah. And then the very next day, my father died. The very next day? The very next day that my father died, and I was the one who phoned him. Wow. Um, and that kind of triggered it all from there, really. Yeah. Because <laughs> obviously, I just kind of broke. <laughs> it's a lot to have to, to cope with, mm. um, especially when, it, when you're that age. Like, you, you're not really prepared for death, you know? No. That's the thing. I mean, like, I obviously, you know, you, 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 your parents try and teach you with, uh, you know, with hamsters and stuff like that, don't they? When you, to try and deal with death, but you never quite deal with it until you face it 
that head on really. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. But I think that's kind of the where the basis of where it all started because it was after that then, well, things started to kind of take a turn and go yeah. downhill. Yeah. I mean, I didn't realise what you know that I had perhaps what what was then um, diagnosed as depression. Yeah. At first, because obviously you don't you don't notice it yourself because it becomes an imbalance in the brain. Um, and eventually, I just kind of was taking one of those um, those tests on the Embarrassing Bodies website. Right, they, have, like, yeah. they have a load of like, different tests. When I was on there for a bit, I was going to be watching the show and everything, and I was just, oh, I'll check, you know, test this, test that. And I came up with, you know, we've got a choice of about three or four different things you may have. And they were all you know, really high for a lot of different types of depression. So I was like, mm, okay, I don't really want to bother the doctor or anyone else with it, because it was just like, you know, a bit embarrassing at the time. Yeah. As well, it was, one, it was one of those things where you just like, you know, you don't really want to talk about it. Yeah. Um, why? Why do you feel that was it that uh, you, you felt you couldn't speak about it or, or even approach your doctor? I don't know. I just I just felt like one of those silly things. Like because a lot a lot of people who haven't dealt with it and don't know much about it. I mean, like I used to be one of them. I suppose was you know it's just like oh I just I just pull myself together I'll be fine. Yeah. And of course once you then live it you're like no that's not that's not how it works at all. Absolutely. Yeah. You do you know I did try and just think oh, I'll be I'll be alright I'll be alright but. Um, Eventually, then I just went. Okay, I'll just I'll chat with him and just see what he says. You know. Yeah. I mean, he'll probably just say, "Oh, you know, you'll be all right, don't have you." But anyway, they, they, they took it very seriously. Right. As soon as I mentioned good. it, he was like, "Okay, well, fair enough. Um, we'll do. You know, we'll just do this one because he gave me this questionnaire thing. Um, and of course, at the time, you kind of with depression, you kind of have days when you're fine and days yeah. when you're not. It all depends on the balance. If you have like a down a down day. Yeah. And of course, when I took the test, then it wasn't a down day. You felt fine. So I felt fine. So of course then it was like, oh no, everything's fine with that. And I was like, I told, luckily, um, I did have my girlfriend at the time with me and she kind of did say, no, no, tell she was in there with him. Well, he was okay when we when we were writing this. Perhaps he should do it again when he's on one of his bad days. And the doctor mm -hmm. agreed. So he gave me another form and said, if you're feeling bad, then fill it in. Filled it in, diagnosed a major depression. And then he was like, right, we'll start you on um, citalopram, 20, yeah. 20 milligrams. Um, I mean, I did. I did end up on sixty for a while, and then I'm now I'm back down to twenties again. Right. Okay. Um, going up, so, so up. you still you still you still have the condition. You still managing it. I'm right? still managing it with uh, with uh, with med medication. Yeah. Uh, out of interest uh, for the the people watching the film, how old are you now? Twenty three. Okay. When did you first start suffering with depression? At nineteen twenty. Okay. Was it any particular obvious sort of cause or? Just. I never really like could like point down the cause, but there was a lot of different things. Okay. Like um like breakups with friends and relationships and then I was a bit down but then more things started to happen, like I started just being a little bit stupid. Okay. Like behaving stupidly and then um a friend of mine close friend of mine passed away and then I got worse into it and then I realised then that I was depressed. Okay. I denied it before. Was there one particular moment or did it kind of come on gradually where you, you realised, hang on, I shouldn't be feeling like this? Uh, it was basically a few friends that just pointed out you need to, like, you're different, you've done this, all this and then I, I clicked, I was like, okay. drastic things have been happening and I, I was wasn't the same and I was different but I was denying so much that I was depressed that right, okay. I didn't even see. Okay, that's, that's, that's interesting. Why do you think you were, you were denying the fact that you were depressed then? Was there... Because, like I said, when I was behaving stupidly and acting out and all this yeah. stuff, people were saying, you know, oh, you're just acting out and all this kind of stuff, but to myself I just thought that I was just having a good time and just trying to forget about a few things but it was actually the more I began to speak about it with people mm. the more I realised how things affected me and how I reacted to them. My name is Frank um, I'm 55 years of age uh, I'm married with three children mm. uh, I live in Clan Dilo. Um I'm retired now but um, for all my adult work in life I was a police officer with South Wales Police um, I'm enjoying retirement at the moment. Um, I'm in a good life in Llandilo, enjoying life and um, enjoying my holidays, keeping busy, trying to keep busy. But um, yeah, life is good.
Well, fantastic. It's yeah. nice, nice to hear. Um, yeah. Now, uh, I know when we've talked previously about this, like uh, you said you have a history of uh, depression. Uh, was there any yes. one particular moment, say, when that kind of started for you, or you realised that, you know, you become depressed as such? And if so, what was it? Yeah, it, um, my depression, the history of my depression, um, or when the symptoms first started uh, appearing within the late 90s, um, I was a police officer then in South Wales Police. Um, I was asked to go onto a unit to investigate um, corrupt practices um, within the police force. Um, prior to that, um, I thoroughly enjoyed my police work, uh, friendly with um, a wide section of officers from across the force. It was a big, a big force over. 5,000 employees. Um, I felt part of a, a big community and I, that I belonged in uh, that, that community. From the 90s then and up until 2000, 2006 when I retired, um, the work that I was doing then was investigating um, police officers. Some of those police officers were friends and colleagues. Um, and that did place a bit of um, a mental strain on me. Um, what I had to balance was um, the, f the need that I had to do my duty as a police officer and yet you couldn't help but feel some loyalty to friends that you had worked with in the past and there was a conflict there um, which played quite heavily on my mind and um, the longer I worked on the department um, they were other considerations that were taken into into, into place, um, I felt that uh, the organisation was quite prepared to um, tackle trivial and um, trivial issues for junior officers, and yet um, some of the practices which I perceived as being corrupt in the higher levels of the force um, were not. Uh, pursued with equal vigour uh, and I tried to, to challenge that um, but didn't uh, receive uh, the support I felt that I, I should, have, should have. Right. Yeah. Consequently, um, it, obviously my personality is a type that I will um, doggedly pursue a course of action if I feel that um, uh, it was right. And I, I got myself involved in a situation of conflict then with the management in um, uh, South Wales Police. And you, you'll see that in, um, obviously with my experiences now and um, I've done a lot of research. Okay, um, I suffer from bipolar disorder, right. which um, basically means I get extremes of mood. So um, I can either have kind of a high mood, it's called hypermania, um, where I kind of I'm a bit euphoric, I'm very active, I'm not sleeping, um, have loads and loads of energy basically. Um, or it can go the other way and um, I can get quite badly depressed. Um, but I can as well um, get kind of periods of normality in between um, where I'm not high and I'm not low. So that's right, okay, kind of the yeah. gist of it. So how long have you suffered with that? I was diagnosed probably coming up for, must be about three and a half years ago now. But obviously I think I've had symptoms of it quite a long time. Probably started having symptoms when I was about 14 or 15 years old. Um, when it first became uh, apparent in your life, you know, how did it manifest itself? What type of things, you know, did it say, make you want to do? Or... I suppose I kind of, I started acting recklessly, which is when considering my age at the time, I was a teenager, it, you could just kind of put it down to normal teenage behaviour really, which is probably why my parents and me didn't, kind of try and seek any help for it so I just kind of you know tried to went out drinking a lot and hanging out quite rebellious um, my parents didn't really know what to do um, I think they found it quite hard they weren't I don't know they uh, they found it hard to kind of broach the subject with me and I think because I didn't really understand what was going on I then clammed up and I didn't want to talk to them about it which has made everything worse in the end really so, so it, it damaged your relationship with your parents then? I think it made things difficult. I wouldn't say, it, you know, we've got a great relationship now, um, but I think at the time it made communication very difficult, definitely. Yeah.
Yeah. Okay. And what about your friends and the wider social circle? Um, that's been kind of an ongoing thing, I suppose. Um, when I was younger, it, I suppose when you're in school, your friends aren't quite. It's not quite the same as when you're an adult. Your friends, it's a bit more of a superficial thing. Um, but as I've had kind of periods of illness. Um, you do find that you find out who your true friends are really because people will tend to drift away um, as soon as things become a bit difficult um, and they won't stick around and be there for you and but then there will be the ones who are there for you and do what they can to help you and that's amazing then finding that out. What like drove you if you like to, to that, have, that, have that sort of first initial diagnosis where say for example like a doctor or somebody would have said to you this is it you are bipolar? No? Um, I think by the time I was around about 20, early 20s, I thought that I just got depressed sometimes and it happened and there was nothing I was going to do about it. Um, but I was kind of in denial about this other side of things where things felt really, really good, um, which, you know, it's quite understandable. Having a whale of a time, don't really want to start saying that that's a bad thing. Um, but it wasn't... I, sometimes when I kind of came back to normality, um, I did look back at my behaviour and think, hang on, that wasn't really appropriate or why did I do that or oh my gosh I've really embarrassed myself um but I, I should I'd never really kind of got anywhere with it it was actually a, a counsellor that I was talking to about some other things that noticed that it wasn't just simple depression um and they recommended that I get referred but I think if they had never they wrote a letter for me to take to my GP and I think of that that gentleman that was uh, doing counselling for me had never done that and written that letter, I might still be stuck in a situation now where I wasn't being managed appropriately and I'd probably mm. still be struggling. I'm Jonathan Williams, I'm the managing director of Nettletown.com and about uh, three or four years ago I was um, diagnosed with general anxiety disorder uh, that caused enormous problems for my family and, um, and, and, for, and for work. Okay, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? What, what type of um, things, you know, would you describe that kind of happened to you then to say to give you this sort of, this, you know, what was it like then having this general anxiety disorder? What type of things did you do? How did your behaviour change? Um, it came on all of a sudden. Um, the anxiety came on um, when I was just starting to have panic attacks. Um, I could be out shopping or panic attacks and in the house to have panic attacks but um, things had been funny for some time before then where I'd always feel as if I was uh, feeling dizzy or uh, as if I was going to fall over but I never understood what it was. Um, once I went to the doctor the doctor said oh you, you suffering from stress hmm. but I said I don't feel as if don't feel stressed so I didn't understand what it was and of course uh, as things got worse with, uh, with stress then uh, the anxiety came along when it stopped me from actually leaving the house. And how did that affect then your friends and your family around you? I haven't got any friends anyway, so... Okay. What about your family then? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, how did it affect? Um, well, I mean, I couldn't, couldn't do anything. I uh, basically locked myself away in, in, in my bedroom. Um, put a terrible strain on, on my wife, so she had to look after all the children. Um, just constant panic attacks, just building up, um, and you know ridiculous, ridiculous things. Like one day, one morning, I walked downstairs, uh, came back upstairs because I was feeling a bit funny. Sat on the edge of the bed, uh, went looking for my pulse, and I said to my wife, "My heart stopped." And she said, "Your heart hasn't stopped, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting on the edge of the bed telling me." Just stupid things like that, you know. It's. It's hard to explain, it is. I've always uh, known I've been suffering from depression, 
Mm. But uh, I know it's a stupid thing to say, but I was always happy being depressed. Mm. Because I always knew that oh, I might be depressed for a few days or a couple of weeks. But I'd always get out of it. And then I'd be feeling great then. And for some reason, I mean, it just came along mm. from somewhere. I don't know. Um, we had a lot of worries in the family. Children uh, being born and uh, premature. And somehow uh, stress must have just built up and, and sneaked up on me. So, given the the the, the details, the you know the difficulties you've just shared with us now, what was the turning point then that kind of led you then to um, to recovering, if you like, then and uh, being able to to function more or less normally today? Well, I couldn't understand what was going on. Why was my brain working against me? Um, I wanted to get back to no normality as possible, you know, as soon as possible. Um, and of course, it was because it wasn't fair on, on on my wife or the children. I wanted to be, you know, an active father with them. Um, so I mean, I just went to force myself to the doctors and told told them everything. Went through the six weeks of counselling course. The only problem with the counselling course was it made me worse because it actually told me more about my symptoms. So I was focusing more on the symptoms. Um, I developed slight um, OCD where I would come to check in my pulse. Um, so my wife had to stop me from doing that. Um, I went on the six weeks uh, counselling then. Right. That didn't, that didn't help at all. It was all like little bits, but uh, uh, I found talking to other sufferers and finding out what they went through and how they managed it helped more. Right, okay. And did that then lead to a more of a fuller sort of recovery or did you need some medication as well then? Oh no, it was the bloody tablets of the doctor that made me the fine man I am today. <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here now. Okay. Nah. Right, so, so we were just talking about like your earlier experience of uh, your particular mental health condition like, um, and um, how you come to terms, so to speak. Uh, it's very interesting when you said that you um, went off to college and you, just, you, know, you studied psychology and uh, lots of different things basically to try and give you an insight say an insight if you like into uh, so your own sort of condition because the professionals around you would fail you in that sense that they couldn't they weren't willing to tell you things you know yeah well i i, I wouldn't say failed me because uh, I, a lot of them provided me with a lot of sort of help and comfort uh, even support yeah but um you know one thing this this still you know even in our technological age one thing this vague yeah, is yeah. a specific diagnosis and therefore without a specific diagnosis you don't get a specific treatment yeah of course yeah. um I, you know all that psychiatric services do is uh, medicate you so that you're not a social problem yeah um and yeah. that is you know they, uh, 50 years ago they were still locking people up they were incarcerating people that, that could be or had a potential to be a social problem. Yeah. Whereas, you know, I think uh, after that period, they, they realized, no, that's not a good idea, incarcerating yeah. people. So then they mentally incarcerated people by medicating them. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it, the, it, the, the treatment hasn't changed, yeah. unfortunately. That um, all they could offer me was, uh, you know, in incarcerating medication yeah. that, that uh, meant that I spent all my life sort of locked in my own house, yeah. uh, hiding away from society because the, the medications are so potent. I, I, I take it, given what you've said, that you're no longer taking any medication now, I take it. Well, I, I use the medication and the services uh, as and when I need it. Ah, right. um, And... Uh, uh, although, you know, at this point in time, I've only recently stopped taking medication that I started taking um, just before the end of last year. After, again, after a, a severe episode um, where, you know, I, I, I call it a breakdown, but it, I, it's a very loose term. It could be any, any way that um, I have a failure to be able to, to cope in, an, in a normal existence. Um, so I then, you know, I, I, because of, of my support network, I'm able then to go to the mental health services or my GP and automatically just go back into that cycle that um, they would love me to sit in. <laughs> they would love me to, you know, they, um, uh, going back last year, the, the psychiatrist said, oh, well, you know, we, 
but we, this time we'll find you a medication that you can stay on. And um, um, my, my argument was, but well, I don't want to stay on medication. I don't want to be drugged yeah. for the rest of my life. Um, I, I, and did I say I sort of, I enjoy indulging in my illness because, you know, I, I, I've been suffering with the schizophrenia and the symptoms of that um, for over 20 years. So to remove that completely out of my life would um, it, it would be you know almost like a divorce? It would be a separation from what I consider to be myself. Mm. So, so you, you're kind of over that sort of like phase in your life, and you no longer suffer with depression. Uh, no, not anymore. No, not anymore. No, yeah. okay. So, what sort of help did you get then? Um, the doctors took uh, well, not took me. They sent me to a place in Kamal then, where I spoke with um, therapists and stuff, and okay. that didn't really help, but. It started to, it taught me to talk to people more because I couldn't really, I had difficulty opening up yeah. about things and I had difficulty going to people with my problems, but it did teach me to sort of be open about things. With so you say we have difficulty going to people uh, with your problems. Do you feel ashamed, say, to burden other people with your problems, say, for instance, or, or do you feel that there was some sort of stigma working against you? Yeah, even when, even when I, it wasn't depression that was getting me down. Do you know if I had a problem... Even if just trivial, small things, I still, and even to this day, I don't really. It has to be something big for me to go to someone and talk to them about. I usually just take a couple of days to myself and then just move on. But like with that point in my life, I realized I did need to speak to someone, and that's pretty much how. Right. Okay. And uh, the cause of this depression was this linked to any sort of like background events in your life? Um, I wouldn't say too far background, but there was a few things leading up to it, I think. That right, okay, yeah, okay. And, um, like you say, you mentioned, say, for example, um, that you suffered with it for a, a few years. Yeah. Yeah? How many years in total? I think it was about three years. About three years? Yeah. And what was, like, what was life like for you then? It was... It was up and down. There would be like a couple of months where I'd think I'd be getting fine. And because like different things used to happen, I used to react to things differently and so much was happening that I was just up and down a lot. And yeah, it wasn't very... So, so did it affect, say for example, your work life, your personal life? Oh yeah. Yeah? A lot. In, in what sort of ways then did it affect both? Um, I just didn't, there was times where I just didn't used to leave the house. so. I didn't want to go outside, so there was, I didn't want to get a job, I didn't want to do anything, I didn't want to talk to anyone, I didn't just want to interact with people, just in case things got worse. I just stayed in my own little bubble, but then there'd be times where I'd be up to go and talk to people, yeah. and then it just used to vary. So when you got that diagnosis then, you know, some people talk about it at last, it was like a release, you know? And it gave them some sort of sense of relief, you know, because they could uh, then get help, you know. How did you feel about it? It was really strange um, because, first of all, I was like, okay, I understand and it completely makes sense now what's been going on. Um, and this is really good. It's an opportunity for me to do something about it, move on with, you know, try and get it under control and try and move on with my life. Um, but then, on the other hand, there was a kind of self stigma in there because one right. of the first things that got happ that happened was that I got prescribed um, something to try and stabilize my mood. It was an antipsychotic drug, um, and I knew um, the pharmacist in the local pharmacy. And I gave this prescription in, and I was sitting there in the waiting room, kind of looking at the floor, going, "Oh my goodness, what are they thinking about me?" And you know, it's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with taking an antipsychotic for any condition. Um, but I didn't want to kind of, I don't know, it, it was just really, <laughs> I just felt really strange. I was worried that the pharmacist, what the pharmacist would think of me. Um, and then um, I went into work and I told my boss, um, which I, I kind of needed to because I didn't have a lot of people around me where I was living at the time. Um, and it was good because she was really understanding and she tried to kind of make adjustments for me whilst I was titrating on my medication and things. Yeah. yeah. Um, but she did um, tell someone else without my permission about my condition and my diagnosis, um, which 
obviously was a big shock to me when this person kind of came out with all this stuff. All. So what's it like having bipolar? <laughs> In the end, I, you know, it was fine and I just settled into people knowing, but I, that decision was kind of taken away from me, which was yeah. quite hard. So initially they were supportive, but like, um, it was a, a little bit of an intrusion into your sort of... Yeah, I think they thought they were being supportive, Yeah. Um, but they... They just didn't ask me first. And I, I do think sometimes if I'd gone to them and said, oh, I've just been diagnosed with diabetes and I need to be on insulin. Quite right, people need to know in case something happens with my blood sugar levels or whatever. But you wouldn't say, you wouldn't go behind someone's back, would you? I, I don't think. And say it would be dealt with much more, kind of. Yeah, but do you think that was the effect of like stigma working in the background there? That perhaps your employer needed to tell someone and get some advice? Or do you think it was just a bit of gossip or something like that? I don't think it was gossip. I think it was genuinely meant, you know, it was from a, a well-meaning standpoint. But um, I think that, yeah, they felt that the, the gravity of the illness, as it were, was, you know, enough of a reason to go and tell someone else because they felt that someone else should know. But they made adjustments for your work all the same and you could carry on working normally. Yes, yeah, so I was really lucky from that point yeah. of view. They they were really, really good. So I mean, you felt that from what you were saying, that you missed out the, if you like, on important parts of like your children's lives as well. You know, so was there um, any one particular moment where you thought, hang on, there's something that's not quite right with me? And if so, you know, how did you realise and did you go off and then seek help or, or did you do something else? Yes. Um, Obviously, there came a time when I realised that um, I'm getting very down, very depressed. There was suicidal thoughts. Um, a few occasions, um, I was reckless with my own safety, um, and so I went to the see the GP, um, a GP who I've got the highest regard for. Um, and really speaking, I wasn't ready at that time to disclose the fact that. Um, I was depressed because um, at that stage, um, certainly in my mind, there was a stigma attached uh, to depression. I didn't want to disclose to anybody else that um, I was not able to cope with what was going on around me. There was that macho sort of thing that, um, yeah, I can, I can take on the world. And so I went to the GP and um, for physical symptoms more than anything. Um, I mentioned earlier about I was uh, being reckless of my own safety. I had, as a consequence of that, I had um, injured myself, um, damaged my shoulder, um, and so I went to see the the GP about that. Um, but in passing, I mentioned to the GP that um, I was under a lot of stress and pressure in work. And uh, in fairness to him, he recorded that in. Um, the notes, my medical notes. Consequently, when things started to get really bad, um, a couple of months later, when I decided I, there's no way I can um, continue working, when I went to see uh, my GP, um, he obviously realized that um, I was depressed. Um, I tried to cope with it without medication, but um, in the end, I went to a police convalescent home because um, I wasn't functioning at all now. Uh, right. <clears throat> the depression had taken such a hold. I'd gone from a man who um, would do eight hours of police work and come home and involve myself in DIY work and um, always wanting to be active. I'd gone from that to somebody who would sit for basically 16 hours a day in the armchair and not move. Um, it removed all my... Um, energy levels. Um, I became totally uh, demotivated. Um, but when I then went to the, the police convalescent home, I, I was referred to a, the GP who operated out of the convalescent home. And um, by pure chance, he had been, um, he'd returned to work after being um, off on the second section through depression. Right. He'd actually been um, hospitalized. He um, spoke to me and he had the credibility and I could open up to him because I, I knew that um, he wouldn't judge me. Um, he knew the reality of what depression was about. So I've been on the medication for about a year. 
Um, and my mate who was also on it but hadn't been taking it properly ended up hanging himself. Oh. Um, and uh, he was a good mate of mine and um, so of course then that kind of spiralled me uh, myself a bit as well. Um, so I ended up in, so then I I just gone down a dosage. Right. Then I went back up again to the to the full sixties again. Um, so did you blame the medication then for that then? For, for your no, well then? no, I didn't blame the medication for that because uh, I knew he hadn't been taking it properly. Right. Because okay. he was he was one of the ones who was like, oh no, I'll be fine without it. I'll be fine without it. And yeah, he can't. He wasn't. Uh, and, I mean, right. we did. You know, we a few of us were trying to tell him. You know, no, you'll be fine, man. Keep it. Mm-hmm. Keep on the medication. Have you ever um, uh, felt suicidal yourself? Yes, um, I had. I have attempted a few times in the past when I was a teenager. Okay. Um, and, and do you mind me asking what what pulled you back from that then? How, what, what what you know what what so you stopped you from, hmm. like, from going all the way and going through with it? Um, well, I think it was my my uh, my girlfriend at the time. I mean, she kind of gave me a gave me a kick, kick in the ass to tell me to uh, don't be so stupid and all that. Um, yeah. uh, but uh, overall, I'm not quite sure because at one point I was I was ready to go. I was just thought, like, bugger it, let's just you know go. And I don't know what stopped me if I'm if, if I'm honest. Okay. It was just yeah. a feeling in my brain like no no wait yeah. now. And I don't know. I think it was just then. It was after that then is when I first went to the doctor about it and everything. Yeah. Um, and that's when. I kind of started to think, well, let's, let's try to pull up from this. Yeah. And then once I did start on medication and everything, it was okay. Um, but of course, once, because I was out, out of work as well and everything like that, it was kind of, it's worse for you again then. Yeah. But of course then, once you slowly start to build up and get a job, because what once I once I became employed, um, I've, everyone who around me has noticed a huge difference in me. Oh, that's good. Um, I've never been there a year and a half now, and um, they've all noticed I'm a lot more positive and... It's just, it's just really, it's surprising what a, a, a small crappy job can do. Yeah, um, yeah. Because of course it's money at the end of the day and you can do more and enjoy more. So part of your uh, history with depression then, apart from people close to you passing away mm-hmm. or committing suicide, so part of that was also financial pressure as well then. Mm. Yeah. I did find that you were just kind of stuck in a loop in the sense of, you know, you can't do, any, you can't do anything because you haven't got any money so you can't enjoy yourself and... You just can't, you just kind of get stuck in this uh, just a, this loop of just being stuck at home, unable to do anything because you can't afford to do anything. Yeah. Um, so, so getting the job then was a, a turning point for you. Oh yeah, definitely. It um, it's mean I can do a lot more a lot more social things, which does help as well to be out and about with you with your friends, socialising that you know helps yeah. to keep you to keep you positive and everything like that. And um, so, so how do your friends feel about your history of depression? I think well, I think when I first kind of had developed was developing the symptoms of it and everything. Of course, n- none of them knew, but it was just you know some days I'd just be kind of annoyed or whatever for no reason, and I'd be really snappy and it kind of they they know it was getting it was affecting a lot of it you know with our relationships and you know friendships and everything, in the sense of you know it's like oh why is he always like that and everything, but um, I think since it's, since it's come out it's just they don't you know it's like oh fair enough it's just part of you. That's fair enough. Yeah. They're all just you know they're like oh it's you. So, so they're all supported them. All they're all supportive, yeah. yeah, yeah. Have you lost any friends as, as a result of your mental health condition? No, I think the only thing it did was, was the the girlfriend I had at the time. It did kind of strain that, and it did. We ah. yeah, we're still friends outside now, but uh, it did kind of strain that, and it did uh, end that relationship. But right, um, okay. I mean, I thank her for being with me at the time, and kind of getting me through it. I think if it was for her, I don't know if I'd be here now. Well, I know that, that's very honest of you, uh, because uh, it's, it's a funny thing with, with depression, you can also be, get to be uh, obsessive as well. Uh, yeah. You know, have, have you had any issues with that at all? Not so much, no. I mean, I did get kind of get to the point where I just thought, you know, what, what's the point of, like, you know, cleaning up after yourself and all this? And you had, like, piles of plates that just, you just hadn't bothered to take out to the next room yeah. and stuff like that. And then, of course, that, that gets worse and everything like that. But then once you do kind of perk up a bit, clean all that you feel a lot better then because you're in a more positive environment um, and it's not dragging you down there looking at all this all this crap piled up so um, no I mean I don't think Um, your mental health condition I, I won't use the word illness 
um, because I just think it's just a part of the personality overall, if you like. Very you much know? so, yeah. Uh, and lots of different people out there, they express their personalities in different ways, different things that make themselves up, yeah, if yeah. you like, into the person that they are. Do you think that's shaped your life then in uh, a great degree? Do you think that you, you say if you didn't have this particular condition, that you might be a different person, perhaps living a totally different life as a result of that? Yeah, you? of course. Um, but then I suppose that trait is true with any part of anyone's personality. Uh, it, if, if that part of you didn't exist, then you would inevitably be a different person and thus take a different path. Yeah. Um, what, what I think what were the issues in my life is that I always tried to conform. Uh, I, I grew up as a teenager thinking that, that I was just going to... Uh, get a job, get married, uh, have, have, a, have a mortgage, have 2.2 children and a garage, and I, I'd settle down. Um, what uh, uh, schizophrenia did was throw a spanner into the work. So uh, every time I tried to fit into what I, I grew up thinking was a, a normal family situation, a social situation, um, I was always having problems fitting into that. The big change in my life was about a decade ago uh, where I thought I'm not going to conform anymore. I'm going to be me and being me, an individual, is outside of that natural Victorian conformity. So, you know, all I did was step away from it, reanalyze what I was trying to do and realizing that most of the problems I was uh, experiencing were due to the fact that I was trying to conform with what everybody else wanted me to do. So, you know, all I've done is, is reconfigured my life. So I, it, I run at my own pace. I run at my own time schedule. I remind people I've, I've only got three days in my life, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And, and no, I, I've no idea what date it is. I've no idea what, what day it is most time or, or time. I, you know, it, I, I don't exist within those social parameters. And I, living outside of those social parameters means that I'm a happier, more um, together person. Mm. You know, even though the illness is a debilitating disability, um, to be able to cope in a normal existence, outside of that, then it's not an illness, it's not a disability, because uh, it's just part of my life. Do, do you feel yeah. now that, so in a sense then, that as a result of all of this, you're now on the right sort of, like your path in life, like you're on your life path, should we say then? Yeah, and one of the things is, A, I feel as if I've got some sort of career, even if that career isn't earning money, um, um, which really money isn't what we year for. You know, again, that's one of the social restrictions that are imposed upon us. Um, but uh, I, you know, I feel that if if there's one person, and I suppose that this comes down to my sort of religious upbringing as well, is that if there's one person that can be um, positively affected by what I say and what I do, then I my existence on this planet has been worth it. Um, the fact that you know I I've got over maybe I don't know fifty thousand listeners worldwide that, that have heard and seen you know what, what I've done done and sung and wrote and um, then you know that that to me means that somewhere along the line I've had a positive effect and because the the you know the input into my music life and my, my musical journey is growing and getting bigger and better every year and more in more and more demand you know um, then I, I I have a positive feeling that this is what I'm meant to be doing. Although, as I said earlier, if if um, it stopped tomorrow and it was just me, my my family sitting on a beach playing the guitar, I'd be more than happy. No, nothing would have changed in my life. I still have to get up in the morning and work out what's going on in my head and what am I going to do, do, do today? How am I going to cope? You know, um, and that's without you know working out well. I, oh, I gotta find money to eat. I gotta feed my family. I gotta clothe my kids. I gotta, you know, and all of those sort of anxieties that most people find difficult, but you find even more difficult if you wake up in the morning and you've got voices in your head and noises and you're seeing hallucinations and flashes of lights and shadows and and all you want to do is put your head back under the pillow, but you you can't. You you've got to get up and try to uh, you know. Uh, it, the first thing I do is work out what's going on in my head, sit there for a minute, get some sort of grip on reality, mm. then I start my day. Um, 
my wife usually tell, lets me know what I'm supposed to be doing, where I'm supposed to be going. You know, some days, you know, she literally dresses me, washes me. Um, you know, if I'm, you know, out of touch, um, then you know, I, I literally physically need to be motivated. Because uh, you mentioned earlier on before we started recording that you presently work as a pharmacist. So you're presently employed. Know, do they make any adjustments for you, or? You know, uh, well, basically, how, how do you manage the condition, you know, and uh, are there any sort of adjustments made for you with, with your present employer? I've been very open with my yeah. present employer and they've been brilliant. Um, my employer, my organisation's actually signed um, the Time to Change Wales organisational pledge oh, okay. um, to end stigma in the workplace, basically. So there's yeah. masses of support going on. It's brilliant. There's loads of awareness raising events. Um, and it's it's just it's really nice to be able to be a part of that as well. Yeah. So I've I've actually been arranging to kind of give talks on stigma within my own um, employment, which is it's really nice just to you know feel like so just open about it, not to have to hide it at all. So it's do been really good. Do you feel that there's there's more work that needs to be done, or do you, do you still say you suffer from the negative effects of there being a stigma out there? So I'm asking. And you, you know, and if so, do you think there's more that can be done or needs to be done? I think there's always going to be more that can be done, yeah. um, because even not in work now, but outside of work, I've given um, talks to people, and you do still get comments coming back that you're thinking, okay, but everything I've just said, then that comment still come back, you know. Um, I think, um, I think the media has got a lot um, of contribution to. Uh, all the stigma that's out there, but things like it. any story about um, any mental health patient doing something, it's you know always front page news if it's something negative. Yeah. But anything positive, you don't see that very often, do you? And it's probably you know the majority of the things that people with mental health conditions do are positive. You know, it's very rare that any of these negative situations happen. But it's, that's always what comes into the onto the front page news, and I think that's a real pity. Yeah, I can agree with that. Um, so at the moment, I would say, given that uh, obviously once you're diagnosed as being bipolar, you're bipolar for life. So I assume you, you still have episodes, do you? Or? Yeah, nothing's perfect. I'm obviously I'm on medication now, which stabilizes yeah. my mood. Um, but I do have ups and downs. It's not. It doesn't cure you. Yeah. Um, so I think, but I've, I've done a lot of other things, you know, medication isn't the only thing that I have to do to kind of try and manage my condition. Mm. And it's, I've tried really hard, actually having the diagnosis in a way has been really, really helpful because it's made me, you know, get up and do things about my lifestyle to help mm. my mood. So like, before I had my diagnosis, I'd go out every weekend and drink and party and, you know, like a lot of people do, you know, just yeah. go out into town. Um, but alcohol really, really negatively affects my mood because as everyone, you know, who's ever had a few too many has probably discovered, you know, it enhances whatever mood you're, you're in. So if you're feeling low, you're going to end up feeling even worse. And if you're feeling hyper, then... Yeah, just course, gonna... yeah. <laughs> so, you know. so you, you've evolved some coping strategies then I take it or, or you've learned yeah. something over the years yeah so can you elaborate a little bit more on what those coping strategies might be so um I've I've completely stopped drinking basically apart from I'll have like the odd one at a wedding or something yeah which I found really helped to stabilize my mood because when I have had that odd one you actually notice it's strange you do notice that you your mood does go a bit um, and it's just things like having a good support network and making sure I've got good friends around me who are willing to kind of accept me for who I am, you know, and that things might go wrong sometimes. Um, I'm really, really vigilant about my finances, so yeah. I try really hard not to let that go out of control. Um, and it's just a routine. Routine is one of the really biggest things. Um, and a really good thing that I did that I didn't realise was going to have such a positive impact was I got a dog. Um, and I never had a dog before. I used to be terrified of dogs. And it's just, it's really good. Because she has to get up in the morning, go outside, have her breakfast. She has to go to bed. You know, you have to look after this creature. It's depending on you. And knowing that is really good because it means I have to adjust my routine to make sure I can be there for her as well. Right, okay, so you've got to focus in your life for mm. that yourself then. Okay, that's fantastic, yeah. 
Okay, and uh, we're talking about the stigma of mental health. Mm -hmm. Do you think more work needs to be done? Do you think there's still a stigma out there, or do you think things are improving? I think things are improving out there, and it's not quite as bad as it used to be because I know a lot more people now are coming, kind of coming forward with it. Um, more so now because I know in the workplace. I mean, I've I mentioned it now my when I when I first started there, and they didn't seem to bat an eyelid about it. You know, it was just like, okay, that's what was, you know, part and parcel, fair enough. Um, I know a few of the guys working with me um, have have some different different things go with, with them, uh, not just depression, but um, so it seems to be more more acceptable now in the workplace. It's not as you know a, a stigma a stigmatism with it or anything like that. Um, it's just um, a bit more acceptable, I'd say now. It is getting better out there. Mm -hmm. um, I think most of the other, with different organisations coming forward and saying you know it's not. There's not, not nothing to worry about, you know. Most people are just like you and me. Um, it's really, it is getting more positive out there for us. Do you still take the medication now? No, um, I have been off medication for the last um, three or four years. Okay. You know, um, I've been I've been through a, a, a huge gambit of um, different antidepressants. Some quite um, uh, strong, and on the last uh, antidepressants. Um, I was on the, the largest dose that um, could be prescribed. Right. Uh, when it comes to, um, say, actually coping with depression, or do you have any sort of coping strategies that you use that help you along? Because I take it as a recurrent problem. It's something you haven't then totally overcome yet, I would have thought. No, no. The, the, yeah. Obviously, the medication was just the start yeah. of um, the recovery, and the cognitive behavioural therapy has obviously been instrumental in changing the way in which I view life. Yeah. And um, key to that, really, is ex accepting responsibility for um, your own mood. Um, there's a tendency when you're, you're depressed to think that, oh, this has been done to me, that has been done to me, um, when in reality, you've had choices to make in life. You know, it was my choice to get into a situation of conflict, right? With all the best intentions in the world to, in doing my duty. And yet, in doing my duty in work, I neglected my family situation and I neglected my own health. Mm. Now, um, the coping strategy is, is to pay attention to your own needs, right? Take responsibility for your own mood, um, because, as they say, bad things happen in life, and yet, um, it's important, you can either let those bad things take a hold, or you can do what you can um, to make things um, into a situation where you can cope. Okay, so like I say, before recording, you've repeatedly said off um, camera that you don't feel anybody is normal anyway. Yep. So the you question I'm asking you, you uh, is basically why would you want to get back to normal, being, well, or you perceive family. as being normal? Well, I'll just say you know, when everybody like, isn't. Or to get back to have a normal family life. Yeah. Okay. To be able to, you know, be an active father to my children. And a husband. Okay. And so it's just not fair to my wife. I'm looking up with all the pressure, the strain of running everything. Okay, that's fine. If there was one piece of advice you wanted to give to anybody that perhaps was going through the same type of experience that you've had, um, what would that be? Well, two I would give. No, no, sorry, three I would give. Okay. A baseball cap, wear that around. You're totally anonymous. People don't look at you. And you can just walk through anywhere. So even if you're suffering a bit of anxiety, wear a baseball cap, uh, keep smiling, and go to the doctor. Go and seek help. The first port of call is obviously a GP, right? Go and seek help. Um, there are other charities and organisations. I do talks now for Time to Change Wales. Yeah. Um, that's a great organisation. But do not remove yourself from your friends and family because they are the, the, the route to recovery. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Basically, as long as you, as long as you can just kind of pull yourself together enough to get out the door and get some help, see, the, see a doctor, see a counsellor, or just talk to your friends and family so they can contact the people for you. You're not gonna be chucking the loony bin for, you know, just because you think, just for, just for something like depression or anything like that. You'll, um, you'll you'll get some help and then they can they can take it from there because they can either give you some medication um, which you can read the side effects for before you even take them if you want um, 
uh, or you can just, you know, they might just take it, let you go to counselling if you don't want to take medication. But it is always a good thing to get a little bit of help because then you can come out to it the other side. Because you will think that, you know, what's the point? There's nothing here for me and everything like that. But even at, even at your lowest, there is definitely a way up. Because if you think that you're at your lowest point now, the only way to go is up. Yeah. But you've got to put the first step forward and then if you want the help, if you want to get better, you can. I think I would definitely say to someone, like talk to people, people who you trust a lot yeah. and you know aren't going to, you know, sort of make you feel like you've got no one else to go to. Mm. And seek out help it's like really hard to do but when you do it it, you, it does get gradually better yeah okay so do you think do you think then it's uh, possible then say that you know given everything that you've experienced and what you've lived through mm -hmm. do you feel that you now live in a full um, productive life as a result say of the help that you've had since yeah definitely getting there i'm definitely much more on track now um i'm in a long-term relationship now um I am moving forward. Um, as a result, I've got you know I've got a job and all this as well. Um, so yeah, I think as a result of the help I've had, um, I am in a much better place now than I was. The message I give through time to, to change Wales really is that um, I'm an ordinary person, yeah. right? I'm no different to anybody else, and we all know now, or we tend to know that, um, twenty five percent of people in, will at some time during their life experience mental health problems. After knowing the uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression, I mean, that it's more than one in four people suffer from it. I think everybody's going to suffer from it at some point. So I think everybody needs to stand up and speak up so that uh, there is no stigma because it's going to come to you at some point. Well, I, I, one thing, I don't know, two things. Um, I would say uh, always have time for people. Always ask Never be afraid to ask questions. What's the matter with you? How do, how do you feel? You know, they, some, some of the things that people don't do, you know, say, how do you feel? How are you today? It's not, it's not a, hi, how are you? It's a, no, how are you actually feeling today? Is everything okay? Then, you know, that has a major knock on effect socially for everybody. But also, you know, keep your personal discrimination at bay. It doesn't matter how you feel about anything, anybody, anyway then um, keep your personal feelings behind when you're talking to other people, when you're spending time with other people, and realize that we're all individual. Yeah. We're all just single people. Every one of us different, every personality different. We will all experience different things in our lives. Be an individual, be yourself, be happy, be safe. Well, we hope you've enjoyed our presentation, uh, Changing Faces. Uh, hopefully today you'll have seen people who look just like you and me, seem like normal people that we'd all bump into the street and they've all been brave enough to share their experience of a mental health condition with us. Uh, we hope it goes some way to removing the stigma associated with mental health because when it's all said and done, nobody's any different. Insane planes on 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 insane planes. Insane play on insane play. <laughs> 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 <laughs>